All right, this is Jeff Challen again. This is part two of assignment zero. This is the second screencast looking at how to get your environment set up and get to the point where you can build and run an OS 161 kernel. So, okay, so at this point, we've finished initializing our development environment. So I have a Vagrant virtual machine running here that I can use. I'm gonna get into that again um, and just verify that the tool chain is installed. Okay, we're all good. So the next thing, so now what we have is we, we have the tools that you need to build a kernel, but we don't have the kernel sources yet. Uh, so to do those, uh, you need to clone our Git repository. Um, this is not the view you would get if you were logged in. Let me sign out here, show you how it looks when I'm not signed in. All right, so here's the URL you're gonna use. This is publicly available. So anybody can clone this. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna clone this into that source directory that's been uh, shared with the guest. I created this file last time, I'm just gonna get rid of it. And now I'm going to do a git clone, and I'm gonna put that right here. Uh, that clones into my current directory. And here I am. So this is nice. I'm um, in a, uh, I've uh, obtained the OS 161 sources. Uh, my working directory is clean. You'll see that the remote that I've established is set up to point to uh, the uh, GitLab. Uh, these are the public sources that are maintained by the opsclass.org staff. So um, one thing you'll do in a later step is actually set up Git so that you can use your own private repository to share changes with your partner. This repository you do not have permission to push to. However, you need to keep our repository around so that you can get changes that we might distribute in the future. So I'm not going to set up uh, my private repository yet, but what I will do is I'll um, rename origin to staff, um, and then I can run git promote dash v, show me that I've renamed that to staff. So this will allow me to set up an origin repository later, an origin remote later that points to my private git repository. Okay. So now I've got the sources, um, uh, now I'm in good, good shape, okay? So just to point out, um, now I, I have two directories that I care about here in my virtual machine. I have a root directory, which was already created for you. That root directory is currently empty. Um, well, maybe it's empty. Oh, look at that. We even put a sys161.conf file in there for you. That was so nice of us. Okay, so this root directory has my sys161.conf file in it, and my source directory in the VM has my my Git repository I just cloned. Okay, so let's get started here. So the first thing I need to do is configure, run the configuration script in the root of my OS 161 directory. So that's right here. Uh, you see that there's a configuration script and I'm gonna run it. And the only thing that this, the only argument the script takes is you'll see there's this, there's a debug. Um, this allows me to compile the user level programs with debug info. Uh, there's no reason for that. You can read the comment. Uh, the only thing I care about here is that this this only really sets one useful option, which is uh, where my OS tree goes. So you'll see that this is by default an OS161 root in my home directory. That's not where I want it in the virtual machine. If you're developing on a machine and you've installed things in other places, you may want to put this somewhere else. Um, but where we're going to put it is we're going to put it home root. And that's it. Um, so all that did is create a defs.make um, in my um, in this directory. You'll see there it is, um, and and that's finished. That's a very quick step. Okay, so let's keep going um, and go ahead and actually configure a kernel. So to configure a kernel, uh, the kernel has its own configuration script and a configuration directory. Uh, that's in here. If you run the config script without any arguments, it'll basically tell you what to do. So you need to run the configuration script and give it a configuration file. So all the configuration files use this shared uh, configuration in uh, comp.kern. Uh, you're encouraged to look into this and, and see how it works. Essentially what this does is it tells the kernel what files should be included in your build. So this build includes a bunch of different files. You can look through this. It also allows you to set options and have those options ensure that certain files get included only when they're set. So you can see when the sync probs option is set, which is something we use for assignment one, then there's a couple of extra files that are included in the kernel build. Those files are not included if that option is not set. All right, so you guys will become more comfortable with the syntax of this file later. For now, all we're trying to do is configure a kernel that has dumb VM enabled. So 
if I look around in this directory, I see that there are uh, four configurations, um, dumbvm opt and generic and generic opt. Um, so what I'm just gonna do is configure a kernel with dumbvm enabled, right? That's not that difficult. Now, look at the output of this command. So it's normally a really useful thing to do. What did it do? It used configuration dumbvm, it generated some files, and then it uh, set up a compile directory for me where I can compile the kernel with this configuration, okay? And that is in compile dumbvm. So if I go into compile dumbvm, you'll notice that this directory was created, didn't exist before, um, and that there's a bunch of stuff in here, right? Um, now, the last thing it says is remember to make depend, and it really should be remember to be make depend, because that's the first step in building our kernel. So if you go back here, what I'm going to do, there are three steps here. The first step is to build the dependencies, the second step is to build the kernel, and the third step is to install the kernel. So to build the dependencies, I run this command, dmake depend. Um, that completed successfully, so now I'm gonna actually build my kernel by running dmake. And so before I do this, just let me show you what my root directory looks like right now. All it has is my sysfunk61.com file in it because I haven't installed a kernel yet. So now, when I install my kernel, let's go into my root directory, there's my kernel. So the way that the kernel is installed, it's a kernel dash the configuration and it sets up a symlink from kernel to that file. So when I run sys161.kernel, sys161 kernel, it's gonna use the kernel that I just created. Okay, so now, I have a kernel. I've created an operating system kernel that's based on the base OS161 sources that you were given. Now this kernel, there's a lot of things that don't work. There are some things that do work, um, but there's a lot of things that don't work that you guys will add in the future during the next uh, few assignments. So now the, your kernel, in order to run, your kernel does not run in your virtual, uh, it, it does not control your virtual machine. That would be, it'd be difficult to compile a kernel that was that complicated. Uh, in an instructional class. So what we do is we provide a system simulator for you to use. It's called Sys161. Um, this is not something that you're expected to understand how it works or to modify the code, although the code is available. Um, but this is how you run your kernel. So Sys161, you can see um, here, it gives you some usage information. It takes one mandatory argument, which is the kernel to run, the file to run. Um, anything so you also want to note that um, any options that come before the kernel name are options to the simulator. Anything that comes afterwards are arguments that are passed to the kernel itself. Okay. Now, the last thing is that Sys161 Sys requires a configuration file in the directory in which you run it. So if I move the sys161.conf file that we gave you away and run Sys161, uh, even if I run it and give it a kernel, it says it can't open its configuration file because that file doesn't exist, okay? So let's move that file back into here, okay? Now, what does this one, the sys161.com file do? Again, there's a lot of comments in this file, like everything that David has distributed as part of OS161, there's a lot of information here about what's in here. Um, but here are the parts that are uncommented at the end. And, and the real uh, critical bits here are is right here, this line. This is the line that you will change the most often and the line that has the most useful uh, options. So what this does, so the sys161 comp file configures the virtual machine that your kernel runs in. It configures this system simulator. So what this says is the system should use 512K of RAM and one CPU. And this is the default configuration that we would provide in your Vagrant virtual machine. Um, the one that we provide online is actually different. Um, I'll show you that one right now. So here's the sys161 configuration file that we provide that just uh, downloaded into on my Mac. So I'm gonna move that download into uh, the virtual machine by moving into the shared directory. And then I'll move that from source here. Oops. And then look at this, right? So this one is a little bit different. This actually configures a machine with eight megabytes of RAM and one CPU. Okay, so let's get rid of this one. So let's go back into our root directory, look around. Okay, so now we're, we're very close to being all ready to go. So we have a sys161.com file that the simulator will use, and we have our kernel. So let's see what happens. Let's run sys161 kernel. All right, check that out. So now you've booted a kernel. Um, 
what does it tell you when it boots? It tells you the base system version, which is 201. Sys161 tells you its um, release code when this was compiled earlier, uh, well, in, uh, just a couple weeks ago. Um, little copyright notice, uh, prints off some things during boot. It tells me that there's 260K of physical memory available. You might wonder, well, what happened to the other half of it? I configured it with 512K. Uh, the other half is used by the kernel. So the kernel itself, uh, the kernel code takes up some space and the kernel configures memory for certain things that it needs when it boots. Um, but this is a pretty minimal memory configuration. It's about the smallest, it is the smallest, I think, that the system will run with. Um, all right, so uh, now, now we're at this menu, right? So this is a weird feature of uh, your kernel. It's not like most kernels because it's an instructional kernel. It doesn't actually run user programs yet, but it does provide this menu that does other things. So that menu includes tests that you can run. Um, some of these things test the core parts of the system that should work. For example, the kmalloc test. This tests your kernel allocator. This is the allocator that allocates small pieces of kernel memory, and this is something we provide for you. Um, and it works. And there are a bunch of tests that you will allow you to confirm it works. So uh, you're really in, encouraged to poke around here and try things out, uh, see what works, what doesn't. Some of these tests will work, some of these tests will not, because they test things that you still need to build. So in particular, these uh, synchronization tests over here, SY1 through SY5, are things that will not work until you finish assignment one. All right, so let's shut down and let's play around in a little bit here just for fun since we got something to work and we're pretty proud of ourselves. Uh, let's configure a system with eight megabytes of memory and eight CPUs. And let's see what happens when we run it. Ooh, cool, okay, so check this out. Now I have a lot more memory available and this is interesting. Uh, this output is kind of strange. So before when I ran Sys161, oops, um, you'll see it printed off uh, a nice thing, uh, CPU 0, MIPS 161. This is weird. It looks kind of like the output of a bunch of different uh, attempts to print CPU 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Um, so CPU zero prints and then brings the other CPUs online. And because your locks don't work yet, all this output is interleaved. When you get your locks to work in assignment two, all those CPUs will print um, sequentially and nicely, but now they're all sort of intermingled. Um, all right, so I'm gonna shut down. Uh, you can see as we shut down that all the CPUs power off in sequence and, and we're done, all right? So now we've run our first kernel. This is uh, pretty exciting. Um, and you know I would encourage you to look at, and try to answer some of these questions. Um, and so for example, one of the things uh, that the kernel will print out is how many times it was compiled, which is kind of interesting and, and maybe something that you'll find depressing <laughs> in later assignments as you repeatedly try to get things to work. Um, all right, so I'll leave these exercises to you guys. Uh, the last thing I just wanna comment on is, is the workflow here. So um, normally when you're making changes to the kernel, um, you're not, uh, you don't need to recompile from from scratch every time, right? So let me show you an example of this. Let's change our kernel so that it prints out something uh, new. Right? This is not going to be here uh, when it boots. All right. So let's print off. Uh, let's make it print something funny. So why don't we say president and well, we shouldn't mess with Harvard College, right? Um, let's put something new here. All right, so let's say it prints off my system version. Okay, so now we can use git to show us that we've changed a file. I'm not gonna check this in because uh, this isn't a change that I, uh, I wanna keep, uh, but let's comp so let's comp compile a kernel that has our change in it, okay? I go back into the compilation directory I used before, and now I can start over. I can run bmake depend, and I can run uh, bmake clean, and bmake and bmake install, but if I run bmake, the nice thing is, is that make is smart enough to figure out what to do. So you'll see that it only recompiled one file, main.c, and then it rebuilt a kernel for me. So now if I run bmake install and go back into my root directory, um, rerun my kernel, you'll see that it says my system version zero. It also points out that I've compiled it twice, which is kind of... All right, so now if things go start to go wrong, uh, if you feel like there are changes that you made to your kernel that aren't being reflected in the kernel that's running. Um, some things to check, some common mistakes. Did you run bmake install? 
is the BMake install going where you think it should go? So if I go into my root directory, I can see, for example, that this kernel was compiled just a minute ago. So that's the kernel I just compiled. Um, you can also check the times, the, the size of the kernel to make sure that the, you know, the, that that's being updated. Um, if, in, in certain cases, there, if you've changed some of the header files or other things, you may actually need to reconfigure the kernel and rerun uh, bmake depend. If you've changed files that, uh, if you've added files to your system and need to include them in the kernel, you need to reconfigure and you need to change the uh, configuration in, um, in your configuration directory, right? So you'd have to actually change, um, need to change com.perm, right? Add, and add, add some things down here in a way that it obeys the configuration file syntax. Um, but, but normally your, your iteration loop is going to be change something, run bmake, run bmake install, run my kernel, see if something works, it does, check in my changes, and then keep going, right? But in general, if, if you, uh, things aren't working, you can sort of back up here, try rerunning the dependencies, try making the dependencies, try reconfiguring your kernel. Um, this step you should almost never have to do unless you've totally replaced your entire source directory, which you should hopefully not have to do. All right, so last thing really quickly is to just uh, talk about how to build the user tools. So these are not things that you need yet because your kernel cannot run user programs and won't be able to until you finish assignment two. When you start assignment two, um, you'll want to make uh, these and install them so you can use them for testing. But for assignment zero and assignment one, they're not required. But right now you'll notice that in the root directory, all that's here is my kernel, um, the sys161.conf, and a couple of disk images that were created when I booted the kernel for the first time. All right, so now let's run, let's build the user space tools. Now, one thing I would encourage is that bmake will allow you to run uh, jobs in parallel, right? So if I give bmake uh, eight, the, the, day, the dash j eight, it'll run eight parallel makes, and that can speed things up quite a bit. So you may want to do that by default. I would encourage you guys to set up shell aliases um, that allow you to run these commands without having to retype bmake, bmake install, that sort of thing. I'm sure you guys can figure out how to do that, and that's pretty helpful. All right, so this is uh, installing all of the user space tools. Uh, this takes a minute. Um, now, again, this is not part of the normal kernel build process. This is something that you should only have to do when you make changes to the user space tools. You are encouraged to create your own tests in user land when you get to assignment two and assignment three and use those to test things that the existing testing suite does not. Um, and when you do that, you'll have to you know, go through this build process. But if you don't do that, you should only have to do it once. Okay, so now I ran bmake, bmake install in the root of my source directory. And you'll see if I go back over here to root, things look very different, right? So that build process installed binaries in bin, it installed stuff in test bin, it installed man pages, um, which you can, uh, which may or may not be useful. So this is all, uh, this is all quite different. So this is what's happened as a result of building the user space tools. My kernel did not change, right? Um, but all the user space tools are now here and can be used by your kernel once you get to assignment two and get, start to get that stuff to work. All right, so that's the, the end of the second screencast. Uh, the next thing we'll move on to is uh, talking a little bit about how to poke around in your source directory and then uh, how to use Git and GDB.